Hey everyone, it's been a while since my last upload, but I'm back and working on at least one more video after this one. For this video though, I would like to share with you my experiences on a little day trip I took a while back. The trip was to a small township in Penang called Balik Pulau. You probably have not heard of the place before, but don't worry as I'll take you through the whole experience and everything you need to know as the video progresses. For a bit of context before we start though, I was on this trip with my grandparents and a bunch of other people from a society they are in, so the day was kind of planned for an older crowd. Without further ado, let's go! The day started with a bus ride through the city and the mountains, into Balik Pulau. Our first stop there was the local market, where we had time for breakfast and walking around. Let's talk about the food first. Spoiler, a big portion of this video will be me talking about food so hopefully you enjoy that. So I was quite hungry that day and went straight for a plate of cha kuei tiao, which is essentially fried rice noodles. The hawker let me film him cooking and was friendly and accommodating when I told him I was vegetarian. He didn't include the usual Chinese sausage and cockle in the dish and charged me 5 ringgit instead of the standard price of 6, which was very nice. The taste was pretty good. It was spicy, oily, and salty. However, it would be lying to say that you don't sacrifice taste by foregoing the meat in this dish, since nothing really takes its place. Regardless, it still had plenty of smokiness and flavor, which was enough for me to happily finish it. For drinks, I ordered a warm barley with no added sugar. I order this all the time at hawker centers I go to. The drink stall owners almost always brew it themselves and it has a nice, pleasant flavor that goes with most food. And this cup was no exception. My grandmother got some kuei talam for all of us at the table to share. Kuei is a broad term that is generally used to describe bite-sized snacks. And talam just means tray, which, in this case, is the cake mold used to shape the dessert that is made from various types of flour, in addition to coconut milk and pandan. This kuei talam was alright. It had fragrance and flavor, although a tad too gelatinous for me. I wasn't quite full after one plate of noodles. So more food! I chose to get pai tea from the store right next to where I was sitting. Like the cha kuei tiao from earlier, this is a dish that isn't traditionally vegetarian. Pai tea is described as a crispy tart shell filled with shredded Chinese turnips and a sweet mixture of thinly sliced vegetables and prawns, according to Google. I'm not sure if there are variations or if these ingredients are essential for the dish. All I know is that I liked eating it as a kid. The nice old lady offered to give me extra shredded turnips to replace whatever meat she would have used otherwise. She was yet another friendly hawker who made small talk with me as I ate. Standard questions include how old I am, if I'm studying, what I'm studying, and what I'm doing here today. Seems like a lot, but those of us who grew up in Malaysia would tell you that this is quite normal. As for the pie tea itself, it was slightly sweet and nice overall. After food, I spent some time wandering around getting shots for this video and stumbled upon cats. Many. Many cute cats. I didn't get footage of all of them, but I did this one which is by far the cutest I found that day. Let's take a few moments to look at this guy. I mean, just look at it. Tell me he isn't cute. He, she, it. Um, I don't know cat pronouns, I'm sorry. Anyway. Because of me just hovering around the cat, I hadn't even explored much of the market before it was time to head to our next destination. In my defense, I don't think there was much to see, since I'm guessing most vendors pack up and leave around breakfast time anyway. I have no regrets. Okay, I really debated whether to include this segment in the video, but ultimately decided to leave it in because I think it is a significant part of the experience. However, I invite you to skip to this timestamp if you don't like seeing animals in tiny cages. I completely understand. So after a 5 minute bus ride from the market, we arrived at Audi Dream Farm, which according to this TripAdvisor reviewer and many others, could be more appropriately named Audi Nightmare Farm. I personally went in blind though, and honestly a bit excited since I thought I'd get to see a bunch of animals in a natural, albeit touristy and farm-like setting. At first, that's what I got. It was fun observing and interacting with the rabbits. I especially liked this one that seemed to be really attached to this pot. But it was also when I was feeding this rabbit and saw the condition of its skin near the eye that I started to get bad vibes. This feeling intensified when I was feeding this group of spotted deer through a metal fence. The enclosure they were kept in seemed way too small for the amount of them there were and something about the situation felt off. However, the last straw was seeing all these rabbits and other small animals kept in these tiny metal cages. 
I immediately realized that the rabbits I saw earlier were the lucky ones, and so many more were being kept in conditions like this. Look, I'm no animal expert and do not claim to know how at risk these animals are or what the baseline standard for animal care is. But as a human, this was sad to see. And although I don't agree with caging animals unnecessarily, I get why you may want to keep some of these other animals. But chickens? Pigeons? I think that it was at this point that I also realized that this isn't a farm, nor does it really try to be. It's just a straight up zoo of sorts. Maybe the goats produced milk, but there weren't that many and they also seemed to be hungry. There were also two cows, a few horses, and an extremely thin camel that looks like it's dying. Which I have footage of but won't be showing because it's just too sad. And I think that you get the point already. Once again, I'm no expert but I think the situation sucks for the animals. And at the same time, I also feel like it's easy to blame, rightfully so, the people who own and run the farm. The animals deserve better. However, I should also recognize the fact that I could be the one trying to make a change. In this, and the many other issues I know exist in our world. But I'm not. I choose to sit here and spend my time making videos. Because that's what I like. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, I don't like acting like I'm better than anyone else with my surface level understanding of the situation. And that's about it. I wish I had some positive or thought provoking message to add here, but I do not. And I think that's fine, even if it's really tempting to always add a positive twist to things. Here's a wholesome moment between my grandfather and I on the farm though. Now, I would like you to meet my good friend. You may have met them before, you may have not. The Malaysian son! Except that was sarcasm because my friend wasn't that good on this day and was in fact out in full force. Also, I didn't have any sunscreen or an umbrella. Why? Because I forgot to bring them. Because I'm dumb. And it was really hot. That's all I wanted to say. I may have developed sunburn. The sun actually played a big part in our entire group's day, not just mine. People actually started to opt out of going down the bus later on because of the heat. The sun was the main character at the farm and also our next stop, the Penang Handicraft Center. Although after melting my way through the heat, the part of it that we visited was essentially just a pottery shop. There is a workshop there, but all we got to do was browse items. If you're an artist though, I heard there are workspaces that you can get around there. But overall, I didn't get the impression that the place was geared towards tourists, even though the size of the parking lot might suggest otherwise. This studio is run by an ex-School of the Arts lecturer from the local university, who seeks to use clay in the creation of contemporary objects such as shoes, shells, and various home decorations. Surely enough, the place had too many pieces to video and even some standout pieces. Like this decorative bowl that was created using a special method developed at this studio. I was tempted by a few pieces but ultimately left empty-handed. After that short stop, we headed off to lunch. We ate at this really scenic coffee shop located right next to a river. We were seated under some shade so I was happy to escape the sun. Man, I really should have brought a hat. So lunch arrived and I was having specially made vegetarian jawami, which translates to java noodles, and as its name suggests, is most commonly found around Indonesia and Malaysia. Most variations have seafood and or meat in it, but mine most likely consisted of a soup base of tomatoes, pumpkin, and potatoes, topped with yellow noodles, slices of potato, deep fried vegetable fritters, deep fried tofu, half a hard boiled egg, some other fried bits, lettuce, and half a calamansi for those who want a bit more sourness. The dish was good. It was sweet, spicy, sour, and was fun to eat as it had a variety of textures, thanks to all the fried stuff in it. Although it was slightly more spicy and sour than most jawami, all the elements of this dish worked together harmoniously, especially the hard-boiled egg, which tied everything together and I wish they had given more of. The real star of the meal though was the drink. The holy grail of Malaysian drinks on a hot day. The one, the only, iced Milo. It was sweet, chocolatey, and rich, all while having the mathematically best drink to ice ratio you have ever seen. You know, I'm quite picky with the quality of Milo since it's a staple that is served everywhere here, so I don't mean it lightly when I say that this one was perfect. Down to the shape, 
texture, and thinness of the plastic cup it was served in, allowing for optimum condensation to happen on the exterior to cool off my hand as I held it. This Milo was so good! After a hearty and refreshing meal, I was feeling rejuvenated and decided to venture out once more, into the scorching sun, as the area around the coffee shop looked nice to explore. I didn't go far due to not knowing when we were leaving, but there was already so much in this small area. First up, at the water edge, we have a few little mud skippers, just enjoying life. And just a few feet away, a group of monitor lizards just hanging out too. I don't know if it's just me, but this one sticking out of the water seems a bit sus. All of this with the beautiful countryside scenery as a backdrop. I had an enjoyable time walking around, but was so, so ready to get back under the cover of our bus and head to our next destination. And then I heard we were walking to it. Thankfully, it turned out that the place was just behind where we were, so it wasn't too bad. So we know that rice can be used for many things. Straight up consumption, made into rice noodles, made into rice flour to make desserts. But did you know that it's also a beauty product? It is called badat sajo, which literally translates to powder cold or cool powder. And this place, specifically this guy, makes it. I didn't know when visiting at the time, but apparently this is the last remaining badat sajo maker in Penang and is decently famous as a result. He started off by taking us through how his product is made. To do an extreme summary, he first blends soaked fermented rice paste and pure distilled water, until it forms a batter-like substance. And then, traditionally using a piping bag but now switched to a handmade mold that his late father designed, he works his magic and gives life to little beads. They are then dried for several days before they are bottled and ready to be sold. So according to the Badat Sajo master, it is in fact quite difficult to get a perfectly even distribution with the mold, and requires skill, technique, talent, and at least 15 years worth of sleepless nights to accomplish. Okay, I may have exaggerated it a bit, but essentially, it's tough, and you'd have to be skilled to completely fill up the paper with nice looking beads like he did. Now, the master gave us each a chance to have a go. And this is where the fun starts. Everybody wanted in. People were cheering, leaning over each other's shoulders to get a closer look at the action, hyping each other up. The master himself acted like an MC to an event, asking the participants questions, getting predictions from the crowd, and cracking jokes. At first, I wasn't that interested in spreading some paste. I'm a gamer and obviously I'd be good at it. But my time and skills should be reserved for things worth my time, like pressing keys and timing clicks. I had nothing to prove and was ready to sit this one out. But I couldn't just let some non-gamer show me up like this. No one is better at games than me, even though this isn't a video game. Time to show the world what three and a half years of pure, dedicated gamer practice looks like. So after a bit of awkward small talk with the master, I went straight in. I calculated all the variables and data in my head and applied the optimum amount of pressure to speed ratio making sure to spread the force equally throughout the mold. It was like King Arthur drawing Excalibur out of stone. I did the impossible. And it turned out terrible. You know, it actually wasn't that bad. If you couldn't tell from how I was setting this up, I was expecting it to be terrible. And although it isn't by any means perfect, I'd say it turned out okay. Gamers for the win. Whoa! Hi. Professional YouTuber here, and also professional face product reviewer. Product review. Yeah, I just felt obligated to talk more about this. Like the actual product instead of uh, whatever that was. It reduces redness, inflammation, irritation. It also absorbs oil and gives your skin a matte finish. Once the oil is all like, absorbed, not, not, not. Not, not now, like, obviously you remove this afterwards, you know. There are no chemicals in this. Six ringgit, a whole bottle of this. That you can use for literally years, like you can you use this for decades. Don't quote me on that. People used to make this at home themselves, but now people don't anymore because why would you when you can just go to the store and get something for Hundreds of dollars. Okay, admittedly, I am not the best person in the world to review this product. As you may have guessed, 
um, I don't use face products and stuff. But I'll review it anyway. I don't have the proper vocabulary for this, but it was nice. After removing it with water an hour later, my skin felt good. It's the next day now, my skin still feels good. Yeah, good. 10 out of 10. Okay, so walking back to the bus now, I really should have gotten a cold drink, but due to being worried about not having enough time, I didn't. This was probably a mistake because even the air conditioning in the bus couldn't save me. I was exhausted. And so for the first time that day, I decided not to go down at our next stop. A fishing village. Now the footage you're seeing isn't from the fishing village we stopped at that day. It's actually from two different ones. One of them I visited earlier this year and the other one back in June 2020 during the peak of the pandemic. Which is more than three years ago now. Wow, we're getting old. Quite a number of people on the trip decided to stay on the bus like I did. I suppose the heat and fatigue was starting to get to everyone at this point. It's probably also the fact that although each fishing village in Penang is unique and has its own charm to it, they all share similar fixtures from the red and blue fishing boats to the motorcycles that are seemingly everywhere. I remember hearing a lady on the bus commenting something like, Once you've seen one, you've seen them all, or something like that as they declined to go down. Apart from its strong stench, I quite enjoy the atmosphere of fishing villages. There's just something about visiting them during less busy hours that's calming and relaxing. Each one of them operates like its own mini community too, which I think makes them worth a visit. Just note that they are usually not covered, so if you melt easily like me, don't be like me and prepare beforehand. It wasn't very long before those who went down the bus returned. Apparently, my friend the sun wasn't nice to anyone that day. And so we headed off to our next destination. A paddy field. But no ordinary paddy field. This is a paddy field with a giant mural in the center of it. Actually, two giant murals. There are two of them. It's double-sided. Honestly, it was pretty cool though. There wasn't much to see, but I think that is the point. The place had nice atmosphere, and the contrast between the colourful mural and the sea of natural greenery surrounding it worked in an interesting way which I never thought I'd appreciate. I got down off the bus due to low-key FOMO from skipping out on the fishing village but ended up really enjoying the experience. I later learned that this location was one out of many around Penang featuring specially made container art, each piece holding a narrative significant to the area it's in. In relatively recent years, Penang has become big into street art and murals. And I take the existence of places like this as a sign that the interest is not dying down. I got back on the bus a bit later because I was trying to get some nice shots of the field and the surrounding area and having a blast while doing so. After returning to the comfort of the bus, we drove to our next and final location. A supermarket. No, just kidding, it was supposed to be dinner. However, we were one hour ahead of schedule due to our very short stops at the fishing village and container art place, so we stopped by this little community of shop houses which did indeed have a supermarket. Up till now, you may have gotten the impression with all the fields, townhouses, and animals that Balik Pulau is the very traditional definition of the countryside. So seeing a Starbucks here may catch you off guard. While it's mostly true that most of Balik Pulau remains pretty untouched by modernization, there have been rapidly increasing efforts to make the area more livable and accessible. New housing developments have popped up in the last few decades, and even the high school that I attended here was built relatively recently. I believe that Bali Pulau is still a mainly agricultural town at its core, famous for producing durian and nutmegs, which we will be having later. But with the relatively new elevated highway and increasing modern conveniences, it is starting to be a more popular place to visit and to live in. I mostly slept during the one hour we were stopped here, hence there not being any footage of me on the ground. Sorry. The real MVP though was my grandfather, who went down and got me a nice, cold, sugar-filled, honeydew-flavoured drink. Normally, I would find the drink too sweet, but I was too exhausted from the constant sun to care. All I wanted was something nice and cool and this was it. Still could only drink this much though, before my grandfather finished it for me. At least he seemed to really enjoy it. Also, since we are on the topic of food again, let me quickly talk about our snack haul. My grandmother bought these prawn crackers earlier on at the market. They looked good, but I didn't try any due to vegetarian reasons. Something I did try though, were these sugar buns that a nice guy on the tour arranged to buy for us, which I ate the following day. I've never had a bun like this in my life before. Usually, they would be stuffed with different fillings such as red bean paste, pork, or anything really. But this one just had a bit of palm sugar on top and nothing else. Um, 
It tasted like a sweet bun, but I'd say it's definitely unique. After a nice nap, I was feeling refreshed and ready for dinner. We ate at this Hawker Center meets local Chinese restaurant place. We ignored the Hawker Center part of it and went for local Chinese cuisine instead, which in this case is essentially rice with dishes. This place had almost as many fans as your average K-pop idol and had a nice feeling of coolness as a result. The tables were large and round and could sit up to 10 people. I think these types of round tables with a lazy Susan in the middle are quite common in Chinese cultures where dish sharing is the norm. The round table also makes the dining experience feel more communal as everyone is forced to look at each other. Now let's talk about the food that honestly looked and smelled delicious. The tables shared this amazing looking tom yum soup, this sweet and spicy marinated pork dish, I think, stir fried vegetables, and a few others, some of which I didn't get footage of. I didn't eat any of those and instead had some fried rice, and shared a pot of steamed tofu and veggies with the other vegetarian on the trip. Not quite the feast the others were having, but it is what it is. The fried rice was nice. It was flavorful and nicely cooked. However, it was quite oily and was especially noticeable as I was finishing it. The tofu dish was alright. It had a lot of vegetables in it which was nice. However, was a bit lacking in flavor. It was also quite oily like the fried rice. The tofu in this dish was made using eggs. And unfortunately, it turned out that my fellow vegetarians sharing the dish couldn't consume eggs which left me to finish the dish by myself. I finished both the fried rice and the tofu dish but was feeling really oily as a result. Thankfully, I had a nice drink to help wash everything down. Nutmeg juice, which is a drink you can pretty much find in every coffee shop or restaurant in Balik Pulau, since this is one of the things that the place is most known for. It tastes quite unique and is hard to describe, but I'd say it has a strong flavor and is slightly tangy, sweet, earthy, and spicy. It is a really special flavor and is enhanced in juice form. Don't get me wrong, I love how it tastes and have liked it since I was young, but I still struggle to finish an entire cup sometimes due to its intense flavors. Oh, I forgot to mention this, but this whole time, throughout the whole meal, this guy was just chilling underneath our table. I filmed it at different points and it was just really vibing. Usually, cats and dogs hang around people during mealtimes in hopes of getting fed, and I thought maybe it was the same with this guy but it really just seemed to be hanging out without much of a want or care for anything. Little guy is living my life goal right now. And that pretty much covers everything we did that day. I guess I'll just talk over some footage for the end of this video. What better way to reflect on the trip than to just walk around the parking lot? The day's itinerary wasn't anything crazy. It was filled with a lot of normal Malaysian things, but I don't think that's the point. I think there really is value in experiencing things with other people. And while it's nice to experience things on your own sometimes, I think just being part of a group really enhances the experience. I don't think I would have enjoyed this itinerary alone, if that makes sense. It was nice having people around. I think I kind of forgot that due to the pandemic, and also due to the fact that I don't really go out. But this was a really good reminder. Much love to my grandparents, I enjoyed just being there with them. I would like to end the video with this sequence here because it really resonated with me. Maybe it will with you too. I think no matter where we are in life, the ideas of success, failure, good and bad don't quite go away. And to cut short all the self-doubt and perfectionist talk, the fact that this ugly but cute looking pigeon keeps trying and trying again despite blatant rejection is oddly inspiring to me. As I was filming this, I was set to use the footage to end the video, sort of as an uplifting thing to end it. However, it is sort of depressing when our pigeon fails for the last time. And that, once again, oddly affected me emotionally. But now after sitting with it for two months, I'm starting to see the beauty in all this despite the seemingly sad ending. And that's this. Failure doesn't matter. It is out of our control. In fact, it is the mere byproduct of us trying. The truly magical thing is that we were given the chance to try in the first place. I feel very blessed. Thank you all for watching.